How many of you know we're in the Father's house this morning? Let's sing this out. Sometimes on this journey, I get lost in my mistakes. What looks to me like weakness is a canvas for your strength. My story isn't over, my story's just begun. Feel you want to find me, cause that's what my father does. Well, feel you want to find me, cause that's what my father does. burdens down Ooh, here in the Father's house check your shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house hey. Amen, let's give Him praise this morning The arrival's not the end game. The arrival's not the end game. The journey's where you are. You never want it perfect. You just want it my heart. And the story isn't over. If the story isn't good, well, failure's never final when the Father's in the room. I say, failure's never final. Father's in, sing it out. Ooh, lay your burdens down. Ooh, here in the Father's house, check your shame at the door. Is anywhere welcome anymore? Ooh, you're in the Father's house. Yeah. We're in the Father's house this morning. We don't have to carry shame. We don't have to carry burdens. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Let's sing this out. Well, prodigals come home. The helpless find hope. Well, love is on the move when the Father's in the room. Well, prison doors swing wide. The dead come to life. But love is on the move. Let's sing miracles. Miracles take place. The cynical find faith. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Jericho walls, Jericho walls are quaking. Strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through when the Father's in the room. Love is, love is, love is breaking through. burdens down Ooh, here in the father's house check your shame at the door is it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the father sing it out church Ooh, lay your burden shame at the door cause it ain't welcome anymore Ooh, you're in the Father's house let's give him praise this morning search the world but it couldn't fill me and man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough that you came along and put me back together desire is now satisfied here in your love yeah oh there's nothing better than you there's nothing better 
shame and weakness, everything from our past, you take that and you make it beautiful. Thank you, Father, 
for looking at us and making us redeemable, Lord. Your love and your mercy is proof of that. And we just thank you. It's in your name, God, we pray. Amen. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives, turning lives up.
Stop working, you never let's declare that even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it. Come on, church, you never stop, you never stop working. Oh, we declare, sing it out, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working. Stop, oh, stop even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, you never stop, you never stop working, oh, we make a work, we make miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 We declare that is who you are. That is who you are. Give him praise this morning. He's good. He's a way maker. How y'all doing? Good? Good? Good. So good to see you. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn around and smile at somebody, but don't shake their hand or don't give them a high five, but just kind of say good morning, all right? And then you can go ahead and have a seat. Hey, that's all right. Thanks, Jeff. You guys doing okay today? You happy to be at the Rock? So good to see you guys. I'm so glad. Thank you. Deb, I'm glad that you're excited about being at the Rock today, okay? And uh, everybody else along with her. Uh, man, I'm glad you guys are with us today. Uh, do me a favor. I know we have some people watching online. We got a bunch of people online with us right now. So will y'all do me a favor and just give it up for everybody who is online with us. So we are so thankful for each and every one of you who are watching from, from home or wherever you might be right now. Uh, thankful that you can be a part of what God is doing at The Rock and being part of our church. I do want to say this. If you're new with us and you're online, do me a favor and text the word CONNECT 
uh, to the number that you're going to see going across the bottom of the screen. Uh, just text the word connect to that number as we would love just to connect uh, with you further and uh, just get to know you a little bit. Um, I'll also let you know if you text that word connect to that number uh, that there's all kinds of next steps that you can take. One of those next steps is giving and uh, we definitely encourage everybody who calls the rock home uh, to continue in faithful giving. Uh, if you're new with us and you're on campus, uh, then you can text that, that word connect to that number. But I would just encourage you if you're on campus, stop by the connect corner. Uh, we've got a gift for you and we would love uh, to get to know you just a little bit better that way. All right. Now, as we dive back into this uh, series that we're calling Dangerous Prayers, I want to start by asking you, uh, to raise your hand at home, I won't be able to see you, uh, or on campus, if you know what the word kintsugi means. Anybody? Anybody know? Okay, all right, finally, I got some, I got a couple. Okay, I got a few of you. That is awesome, all right? Kintsugi, Benny, you didn't know what kintsugi is, did you? I didn't figure, all right? Um, but, but anyway, uh, I, I mean, I'm a little live this morning, sorry, don't mean to be calling people out like this, but kintsugi is the Japanese art of putting things back together. Uh, specifically, when you talk about like a bowl or a piece of pottery, um, a, a pot, something like that. Uh, obviously, uh, for you and I, when we break a bowl, we just want to throw it away because it's useless. Um, but the Japanese culture, years ago, years ago, they figured out a way of putting a pot back together. And the way they would do it is they would take gold or silver and some other resins and they would glue it back. They would fashion it back together. And they call this the art of kintsugi. And the reality is that if you buy a piece of pottery today that has had this type of work done, it is worth way more than it was originally. Meaning the original part uh, pot had some value. When it's broken, it has no value. But when you put it back together with gold, it actually has more value. And what I want us to do today is to see how this Japanese art of kintsugi can actually work in our lives as well. Because many times we think if we're broken, we have no value. But what I would say is if we actually asked the Lord to break us and then to fashion us back together with his blood, then we have way more value than we actually had at the beginning. That, that the art, I shouldn't even call it the art, the fact of Jesus using his blood, uh, which is worth far greater than gold, to fashion us back together ends up leading to a beautiful thing. Uh, another way I could say that today is this, is that... If you are broken, brokenness can lead to a breakthrough, and the breakthrough is actually something that is very beautiful. Hear that statement again. When you are broken, it leads to a breakthrough, and the breakthrough is something beautiful. And what I want to challenge each and every one of us to do today is to pray a difficult, dangerous prayer of, Lord, break me. Because when he breaks you, then what he can do is he can fashion you back together, which will lead to a breakthrough, which will be beautiful. Well, what do we want to ask the Lord to break us of? Well, I, I would challenge that uh, to, to, one, just leave it at that. Lord, break me can be a blanket statement in all kinds of directions. But to break you, one thing that has to happen is we have to be broken of our pride. For us to be broken, we have to be broken of pride. And when we're broken of pride, then we can break for his people. We're going to see that as we look at David's life. And, and David, he actually said a prayer uh, that we find in Psalm 51. And in this prayer, he talks about this idea of brokenness. And here's what I want you to do, whether you're at home or, or, or here in Conway, I want you to repeat the, these uh, blue words when I get to them. You just say them out loud for me, okay? This is Psalm 51, verse 16 and 17. It says, you do not want to sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a? You will not despise a broken and? Oh God. 
that the sacrifices of God is a broken spirit. And God will not deny a humbled heart. He won't despise that. So today that challenge really lands in this idea of God break me. And God specifically break me of my pride so that I can be broken for your people. See, the backstory of David's life is he had some pride come up, and that pride leads to destruction. And pride will always lead to destruction. We see that in the book of Proverbs. It said pride comes before a downfall. All right? And David, he was a man after God's own heart. He was a guy who was seeking after God, trying to follow God. But we see a couple times in his life where he allowed pride in. And when he allowed pride in, both times that we see in his life where pride came in, destruction followed. And the first time that we see pride coming into David's life is this story. See, the backstory of Psalm 51 is one day David was hanging out at his palace. Now, David, he was the king, all right? Um, and, and while he was king, he was hanging out at his palace. Now, the springtime had come, and it was time for the men to go off to war. And normally, the king would go with the men. He'd go with the soldiers, and he'd go out and fight the battles. But this spring, he decided to, to set back. And we don't really know why. We don't know if in, the, in his heart he was like, I've had enough war. I'm going to let them do it this time. Uh, they don't need me. I'm tired. We don't know. We just know that he stayed back while all the men went to war. And while the men were at war, he was hanging out at his palace. He was looking over the city at one point. And as he was looking over the city, he noticed a house where a woman had come up on top of the roof. Uh, her name was Bathsheba. He, she came up there to, to take a bath and to sunbathe. And, and David saw her, obviously he saw a naked girl. And he's like, all right, she looks good. And he should have turned away. But instead, he kept looking at her. And then he went to one of his servants. He said, who is that lady? And the servant went and found out and came back and said, that's Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, when David heard that, he should have immediately went, whoa, and backed off and walked away and quit looking because Uriah was one of his dudes. Uriah was one of his men. Uriah was one of his soldiers, one of his leaders, and he should have realized immediately that is the wife of one of my guys, and I need to walk away from this. But pride was in his life. So instead of humbling himself and walking away and recognizing that he was gazing at somebody else's wife, he decided that he would have let pride live, and he sent his servant to go get her. And Bathsheba came to the house because the king had summoned her, and that's what she had to do. And then he slept with her, she went home, and then she sent word back a little bit later that she was pregnant. Well, when David heard that she was pregnant, he actually sent for Uriah from the fields and brought Uriah home and said, hey, go, go be with your wife. And, and uh, he went home for a while but would never go in, never really spend time with her. He slept out on the, on the porch, and David's like, why are you sleeping on your front step? Go in and sleep with your wife. And Uriah said, how could I dishonor my men that way? My men are sleeping in the fields because they are at war in, in tents. There's no way that I could dishonor them and go sleep with my wife. David tried to get him drunk and see if that would work, and that didn't work. So eventually, David sent him back out into the battle, but sent a note along that he had to give to another person. And that person uh, was instructed to put Uriah at the front of the lines, and when the fighting got bad, to withdraw so that Uriah would die. So David gave a death sentence to Uriah. One day, a guy named Nathan came to David. Nathan was a prophet. Uh, he was a, kind of the spiritual advisor uh, to David. And he came to David and he said, David, can I tell you a story? And David's like, yeah, tell me a story. And, and Nathan said, uh, there once was two men in a village. Uh, one of them was very wealthy and one of them was quite poor. Uh, the wealthy one had all kinds of cattle and livestock and sheep. The, the poor man... He had only one little lamb that they had had since he was young. The little lamb would uh, eat with them and sleep with them and was basically treated like a child. And one day, the rich man had a friend come over and he wanted to serve him dinner. So he went to the poor man's house and stole his little lamb and brought the little lamb home and butchered it and served it to his friend. Immediately, David just like burned with anger. 
And he said, that is not right. The man who did this should die immediately, should have to pay for what he has done. And then Nathan just simply looked at him and said, David, you are the man. David, you are the man. In your pride, you went and you grabbed Bathsheba. In your pride, you slept with her. In your pride, you killed Uriah the Hittite. That the pride of David had gotten in the way way and destroyed him and had destroyed others. And finally, David is being called out on it and he comes to his senses and his heart breaks. He becomes a broken uh, piece of pottery that, that he basically is getting down on his knees and he's praying because he's saying, Lord, I have messed up. I can't bring you a sacrifice because that won't work. I can't bring you an offering because that won't work. What you need, God, what you desire, what you you ask of me is a broken spirit and a humbled heart. And that's what David has in that moment because he recognizes finally that pride has destroyed him. And I think too many times in life, we run in the same shoes. I think too many times in life, we allow pride to come in, and pride leads us rather than humility. And the challenge that I have for each and every one of us, whether you're online or on campus, is right now is to let your pride fall. To say, Lord, break me of my pride. See, I think David, where David got into trouble is he was at a point in his life where he thought everything was about him. That I'm the king, I can do what I want, I've built this this kingdom, I've built this palace, that, that I've got all this stuff going on in my life, I've fought wars, I've defeated giants, and all of a sudden everything became about him. It's almost like rather than seeing himself as the the pottery, rather than seeing himself as the clay, he saw himself as the potter. That he saw himself like, I'm the one who's made all of this so I can do what I want. And I think if we're not careful, that's what can happen in each, and, uh, each of our own lives. That we can think of ourselves that we are the potter and we're the one making something in life. That we're the ones that are, are, are responsible. That we're the ones that have done, done it all. We're the ones that have, have accomplished it. Rather than recognizing, wait, no, I'm just a piece of pottery in the potter's hand. And me working and serving and giving him glory, he's able to do things through me. Do you see how sometimes we get it backwards? How sometimes we think of ourselves as the potter rather than thinking of ourselves as the pottery. Uh, g- God brought this up in the book of Jeremiah, and this is God speaking. He says, O Israel, can I not do to you as this potter has done to his clay? As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. What he's saying here is when you think about a, a potter as he's putting together a piece of pottery on the, on the wheel that if he doesn't like the way he, it's forming, he'll just squish it and start over. Or, or he'll take that piece of uh, work that he has and he'll put it in the kiln and when it comes out, if it's not what he wants, he can just throw it away because he's the potter and the potter has the opportunity, the desire, the right To do that, the prerogative to do that. But but unfortunately, Israel was thinking, no, we're the potter. And God was saying, no, Israel, you're not the potter. I'm the potter. You need to simply be pottery in my hand. And I think that's where we need to get at this point when we understand this prayer of, Lord, break me. That we say, God, I'm going to let my pride fall. I'm going to let my pride be broken, and I'm going to humble myself and recognize that, that I'm the pottery, that I'm the clay. And God, I'm going to allow you to mold me, and I'm going to allow you to make me. What would it look like if we prayed, Lord, break me of my pride? And guys, I can say that, that this is essential. Uh, I I can confess to you that when I was in my 20s and 30s, I was a very prideful young man. 
All right? and, and I'm a dude, I'm a preacher, I still struggle with pride today. It's something I still want to pray against and, and pray that the Lord breaks me of it. But especially in my 20s and my 30s, that, that, that I struggled with pride. And I was taking, taking uh, ground for the Lord. All right? It wasn't like I was being prideful in my own work. It was just like I was traveling America, I was preaching, I was helping people come to Christ. And, and it was just one of those seasons in life, I'm just running for the Lord. And people started challenging me, Josh be careful of pride. I'm like, oh no, it's all about Jesus. But I had allowed pride to come into my life. And then eventually what ended up happening is trials hit, uh, hardships hit, and I felt like a broken vessel. But it was because of that trial and that hardship that that pride got broke. And then I remember sitting there as a broken vessel, sitting on my driveway and going, Lord, my life is over. Lord, like, like I, I've got nothing now. I'm a broken vessel. And I think it was at that point that Jesus said, now, now's where my greatest work can go. Right now is where my greatest work can begin. Because when we recognize in humility, I am nothing more than a broken vessel, it's at that point that the Lord can start fashioning us back together again. So let's pray, Lord, break me of my pride. What would it look like if everybody who's in this room right now, at the end of this message, would say, Lord, I'm going to pray that. I'm going to say, Lord, break me of my pride. And I really believe if each and every one of us would do that, if we said, Lord, break me of my pride, then we can move on to the next part of the prayer. And the next part of the prayer, I would say, is this, is Lord, break me for your people. Because if we, if we haven't been broken of our pride, then we'll never break for people. You see, David, if he had been broken of his pride, he would have never slept with Bathsheba. If he didn't have pride in his life, he would have said, that's Uriah's wife, and then I'm, go- I'm going to walk away from this, uh, that I can't take her to be my wife. But, but, but because of pride, he wasn't broken for people. Because of pride, he killed people. But when we humble ourselves, it's at that point that we can finally break for people. And I want to challenge us right now, that we need to be broken for people people, for God's people, for the Lord's people. And would you admit with me right now that we live at a time in America where there's a lot of brokenness and a lot of broken people? You with me? So let's talk for for just a few minutes about what would it look like if we actually said, Lord, break me of my pride and break me for your people. What would it look like if, if we looked into just everything going on in our culture right now and said, Lord, break me for, for people who are hurting because of COVID? What would it look like if we looked at our African-American brothers and sisters and said, Lord, break me for my people? Break me for people. What would it look like if we looked at people who are going through financial hardship right now and said, Lord, break me for people? We live at a time right now in America where the church needs to come together and fights for unity in America because people matter to God. And I believe that individually, I believe as individuals, that you can do something that could radically change this world. I think I could say it this way. I believe you as an individual could could eradicate racism in your circle if our hearts broke for people. All right? You might not be able to change the world. You might not be able to change other places. You might not be able to change some place that's 20 miles away from you, but you could change your circle if we just said, Lord, break me for people. And what I'm going to say is I, I'm going to use what's going on in our culture right now uh, because of what's happening uh, to our African-American friends right now. I'm going to use that as an illustration because it's happening right now. But, but make sure you hear this. Everything I'm going to say for the rest of this message applies uh, to, to those who are of a different race than you. But it also applies uh, to those who are, have disabilities. It applies to the child who doesn't have uh, a dad at home. It applies to the senior citizen who is in isolation because of COVID. What, what I'm going to share, it, 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 you can apply it in any situation with any person. If you want your heart to break for people, 
then what I believe we've got to do is we've got to believe that people are better than us, we got to be brothers, and we got to bear one another's burdens. That we've got to first believe that others are better than ourselves. Now, if you've got pride in your life, you'll never do that. David, he didn't, he didn't think of Uriah as better than himself. He didn't think of his soldiers as better than himself. That, that he sat back at his palace because he's like, I'm the king. And because I'm the king, I can do what I want right now. And he sent his soldiers out. I'm the king. I can do what I want right now. I can sleep with that lady. I'm the king. I can do what I want. I can send soldiers into a, uh, into a meaningless battle where Uriah will die. But if Uriah died, guess what? Some others died as well. Because David did not believe that others were better than himself. So what would happen if we believe that people are better than ourselves? James chapter 2 verse 1 says it this way. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? See the weight of that scripture for a second. Everyone, see the weight of that scripture. You know, you realize what it's saying. It's saying if you claim to have faith in Christ, then you cannot favor some people over others. You can't, right? And James isn't talking about can I have a best friend here and, and, I, and, and I have a best friend and then I have friends. He's not talking about that at all. Obviously, you're going to hang with certain people, stuff like that. That's not what he's talking about. He was talking to a group of people who called themselves Christ followers who refused to hang out with another group of people because of their socioeconomic status. He was saying this group of people was saying that they are better than this group because this group didn't have everything that this group had. He's saying that's not of God. Now you cannot show favoritism that way. Look at another verse. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, do not be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Again, it, without humility, I'll never think of others as better than myself. But with humility, I can look at everyone. It doesn't matter their socioeconomic background, doesn't matter their race, doesn't matter anything about them. I can look at everyone and I can treat them as better than myself. If I want my heart to break for people, i got to believe that people are better than me. I've also got to be brothers. Romans says it this way, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Outdo one another in showing honor. If you look at somebody as your brother, if you look at somebody as your sister, that will totally change the way you would think about them, right? You know what I mean? Like you might make fun of your brother, like, you might pick on your brother, right? Like, how many of y'all have a younger brother or an older brother? And you, you, you've had those little, right? Like, like, you'll go after. But if somebody else talks about your brother, oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Somebody talks about your little sister, oh, it's on, right? Like, what would happen if we started looking at everybody we're coming in contact with in our neighborhood, in our school, at work, wherever it might be, and say, that's my brother, because if it's my brother, I'm going to treat him totally different. In Philemon, Philemon is an interesting book. Excuse me. Uh, Philemon uh, is a little bitty book. It's only one chapter in the whole Bible. Philemon was a slave owner. All right? Now, slavery back then was totally different than what we think of as slavery in America. All right? Slavery back then was somebody couldn't pay their debt, so they basically said, I'll be your slave. I will work for you until I can work off my debt. So Philemon was a slave owner, and his guy who owed a debt had run away. And this guy had run away, had come to Christ, um, and Paul was ministering to him and discipling him. And Paul said, dude, you need to go back. You need to go back. But Paul sent a letter to Philemon, this slave owner, and this is what he had to say. He said, he is no longer like a slave to you. He is more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother especially to me. Now, he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Don't miss that last word. He will mean much more if you'll just simply recognize him as a man and as a brother. That if you want your heart to break for people, then we have to make sure that we're thinking of others as better than ourselves. We have to make sure that we think of others as brothers. And then lastly, I'd say it this way, is we got to bear 
people's burdens. Let me just say this right now. We got to bear people's burdens. Romans says it. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And I don't know if you recognize this or not right now. But our African American brothers and sisters are hurting right now. They're hurting. Many of you have friends who are African American and they're hurting right now. And they're hurting right now because of, of things going on in America, all right? Uh, they're hurting right now because of COVID. I don't know if you realize this. You can look around the room, okay? We are a very diverse church. But right now, let's admit it, we are a very white church. Like if you're just looking at on campus in Conway. And here's why. Because COVID is attacking the African-American community. So many of our, our friends who come to church with us every week, they're watching at home right now. And I'm glad you're watching at home. I want you to feel safe. But you know that I weep with you and I hurt with you because I know you're going through a lot right now. And I want our church to recognize that because we have to bear one another's burdens. We have to weep with those who weep and we have to rejoice with those who rejoice. We sat in a staff meeting a couple weeks ago and I had the African American ladies on our staff just share from their life experiences. And they talked about a lot of hurt and a lot of pain. There was a lot of tears that day. This past week we had a friend of mine who's a a church planter in this community. He's an African-American gentleman, uh, but he's also a retired police officer. And I said, I want you to talk to us as a police officer, as a pastor, and as an African-American man. And he shared some things that really enlightened us as a staff on how we can bear one another's burdens. And that's a challenge. What would it look like if we started bearing one another's burdens? Uh, look at this verse from Galatians. Carry one another's burdens... In this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. And what is the law of Christ? To love one another. To love one another. To love one another. That, that, that Jesus said it this way. That the number one way that you fulfill the law is that you simply love one another. And when you bear one another's burdens... That's when you are loving one another. What would it look like if you said, I want to bear the burdens uh, of those uh, uh, in my community who are black. I want to bear their burdens. I want to feel what they feel. All right? Now, I can never fully walk in their shoes, but I can bear a burden with them. What would it look like if I said, I'm going to bear the burdens of a senior citizen who is isolated right now because of COVID? I might not be able to walk in their shoes, but I can carry the burden along with them. What would it look like if I bared the burden of a parent who has a child with disabilities? And what would it look like if I started to feel what they feel? What would it look like if I said, I'm going to bear the burden of a child who doesn't have a father because I want to feel what they feel? What would it look like to bear the burden of an addict and to say, I want to feel what you feel, the weight of your life? What would it look like to bear the burden of somebody who is financially struggling right now because of the life that's going on in America and feel what they feel? What would it look like to, to bear the burden of somebody who's going through uh, an illness, whether that's COVID or whether that's cancer? Answer, whatever it might be. You might not be able to walk in their shoes, but you could carry their burden with you. And I, I know this will happen. When we start carrying people's burdens, that will break our hearts because we'll finally start feeling what they feel. And that's, that's why the challenge goes out. Lord, break me. Lord, break me. Lord, break me of my pride so that I can break for your people. Because I'll never be broken for God's people, for all people, until I'm broken of my own pride. And that's the reason the biggest prayer I, I challenge you to pray today is just simply this. Lord, break me of my pride. Lord, break me of my pride because I want to be broken for your people. 
Because the bottom line is we live in a culture that is broken right now. And, and reality is, like, like we might want to try to put it back together. We might want to say, well, I, I need, I need to, to do the work, but, but we can't do this on our own. The only thing that is going to put this back together is the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what's going to put it all back together. And when we are broken of our own pride, it is at that moment that I can say, now, Lord, that I'm broken, one fashion me back together. So that the world can be fashioned back together. So we're going to do a time of response right now. And as we do this, I'm going to give you a difficult challenge. But just a real challenge pray Lord break me Lord break me of my pride Lord break me of my pride that is making me think that I'm better than somebody else Lord break me of my pride and my unwillingness to call somebody a brother or a sister Lord, break me of my pride in my unwillingness to carry somebody's burdens. Lord, just simply break me of my pride. And when you get broken of your pride, I think it's at that point that the blood of Jesus becomes the glue that fashions us back together again. And as the blood of Jesus becomes that glue and fashions you back together, then you get a breakthrough. And you become even more beautiful. Because his blood, which looks like scars, becomes your testimony. And what the world needs more than anything else is the blood of Jesus to glue us back together. And that's going to start by the church praying, Lord, break me of pride so that I can break for people. So we're going to go into this response time. We're going to do things a little different this morning. Because I'm going to challenge you to to simply say that prayer. And and every week so far, what I've done is anytime we've done this prayer, I've, I've challenged you to maybe raise your hand and to say, I'm willing to pray that prayer set for the next seven days. And today, I'm going to challenge you differently. I'm going to challenge you in an act of humility to say, Jesus, break me of pride. And I'm going to challenge you to bow. Instead of challenging you to stand up and to raise your hand, I'm going to challenge you to bow. Because bowing is an act of humility. And bowing might be, you might just want to sit in your seats and you might just want to bow your head and say, Lord, break me. Or what you might want to do is you might want to get down on your knee right there in your chair. There's plenty of room the way we have things spaced out. And just bow a knee as an act of humility to God. Say, God, break me of my pride. Or maybe you'll join me because I'm going to be bowing up front. There's plenty of room up here. Then maybe you want to come up front and maybe grab some communion and take a knee and say, Jesus, I'm going to bend my knee because I'm recognizing my pride and I'm humbling myself before you and you only as an act of humility. And maybe for you today, you've never surrendered to Jesus Christ. Maybe for you, today is a day where you're going to to bow before him. Where maybe you're going to say, Jesus... I'm going to surrender my pride. I'm going to humble myself because I know I'm broken and I need you. I just need you. So would you do me a favor? Let's go into a time of prayer. And if you want to bow your head and say, Lord, break me, you do so. If you want to bow a knee, and pray, Lord, break me and do so. If you want to come up front, you feel free to do so. And let's just enter into this kind of posture before the Lord. 
eventually in the song, if you want to stand, you feel free to, but don't feel like you have to. Let's go before the Father. Jesus, I bow before you right now. And Lord, I pray, break me. Just break me, Lord. Break me of my pride when I think that I'm better than others. Lord, break me of not seeing others as family. Lord, break me when I don't carry people's burdens because of my own pride. Lord, break me of pride. And then fashion me back together through your blood. Because you are what I need, Jesus. You are all that I need. So we sit at your feet. Caught up in this in holy moment. Never want to leave. I'm not here for blessing. Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. Well, I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry when I just sing another song. Take me back to where it started. I open up my heart to you. Yeah, I'm sorry when I've come with my agenda. I'm sorry. I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where it started I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence I just want to see holy moment I never want to leave I'm not here for blessings Jesus Jesus you don't owe me anything more
all about you, Jesus. It's all about you, Jesus. God, we just focus on you this morning. May our hearts break for what breaks yours. I just want you and nothing else. Nothing else, nothing else will do. And nothing else, and nothing else, nothing else. Let's sing that to the Father. I just want you, nothing else, nothing else. Nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else. Just tell the church. Nothing else matters. Just you, Father. can put us all in this world back together. Amen? That's why we do what we do, right? We come here, we glorify God, we get together, we get encouraged because we know that Jesus is the one who can put everything back together again. He's the one that can put it back together in your life. He's the one that can put it back together in your family. He's the one who can put it back together in our community. He's the one who can put it back together in this world. And the way that we come alongside of him is we break ourselves of our pride and in humility say, Jesus, I'm just a pot. I'm just a bowl. I'm just a piece of pottery. But I'm willing to be on display and be used by you and for you in whichever fashion you want me to be used. And he takes that brokenness where that breakthrough has happened, he makes it beautiful, and he uses us to change the people next to us and around the world. So let him be the glue in our lives and let him be the glue in this community and let him be the glue in this broken world. 